يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد Welcome to the program where we ponder over the verses of the Quran for the benefit and the reason that we need to hold fast to the book of Allah, applying the order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kitabun anzannahu ilayka mubarakun, liyaddabbaru ayatihi, waliyatadhakkara ulul albab, that this is a blessed book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, for what purpose? For people to ponder over its verses. And this is our job, and this is what this program is for, is for us to ponder and to look deeply into the verses of the Qur'an to try to see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us with regarding to our deeds done by our hearts, the things that we say with our own tongues and the things that we do in our life, in all of our affairs on the face of earth, in all of our relationships, whether it's towards our own selves or our families, wives, husbands, children, neighbors, people at work, people with you in school, those who are elders, the young, the enemies, the friends, the Muslims, the non-Muslims, all of our affairs, all of the things that we do in our life, whether it's speech, whether it's action, whether it's a state that we are in, we are in need to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us so that we act according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. And this is how we seek this guidance. And this is how we need to change our lives to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us because we are servants of Allah. That we do not live our lives based on our own desires, but we live our lives according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the, heaven and the heavens and the earth, He wants us to be. And this is the intentions and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us sincerity and, truth, and truthfulness and for Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us the truth and to show us the way of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Today inshallah ta'ala with verses number 4 and 5 in the beautiful surah of Surah Al-Fatiha, the best surah, the most virtuous chapter in the Qur'an as the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, we need to look closely in these two verses. Maliki yawmiddin, iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. Maliki yawmiddin. Malik meaning the owner. And in another recitation, which is a correct recitation, Maliki Yawmiddin. Both are correct. Malik and Malik. Malik with an alif after the meme, Maliki Yawmiddin, means the owner of the Day of Judgment. Maliki Yawmiddin, the ruling judge of the Day of Judgment. And both correct, of course, and it both actually enrich the meaning. What is the meaning of Malik? Malik meaning the owner. And this is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is the owner of all things. Everything is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The human being, all that exists, everything is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a belief. And also with it comes the practicality of it. The effect of it in the heart of a Muslim. That we are owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means we do not have a say or the freedom to do whatever we want. We need to fulfill the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the real freedom. The real freedom is to realize that and to submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say for example you own certain amount of money 
and we have ownership. We own things in this life. This ownership is deficient. Why is it deficient? Because, and it's not complete, it's not perfect. Because we have to die at a certain point of our life. We have to depart from this earth. Nobody claim whatsoever that they would live forever. And whatever we own, whatever we accumulate, one day we have to leave it behind. When we leave it behind, it's not us, it's not ours anymore. It belongs to someone else. Then others would have ownership of it, whether it's our offsprings or whatever there is. So it's not really the real ownership, because the real ownership, it's something that would stays forever. So as a result of that, we believe and we have to have this feeling in our hearts that we basically are entrusted with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the things that we own, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge us according to the things that we own, whether we dispose it in the proper way to be servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or whether we abuse this amana, this trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted us with. So we need to change the way that we look at things. Your money, yes, you own this money. And in Islam, there's no such a thing as uh, shared ownership. But each person has his ownership and it's respected. No matter how much you own, even if it's millions, that's your money. Yes, it's your wealth. But this is when it regards or versus one another. But when it comes to our behavior, our attitude towards our wealth, we believe that it's owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we earn it? It's something that we have to believe and we have to act according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us and, and show us how to earn our wealth from permissible sources, not from something that is evil for us, harmful for us. And we also need to know how to expend, spend it in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how to use it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's owned by the creator of the heavens and the earth. Yes, we can enjoy our wealth by spending it in a proper way, in the permissible ways, but in our hearts we always believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of all things. That brings happiness actually and contentment in the heart of the believers. Whether they are poor or rich, they look into the wealth as a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether they would use it in the proper way or whether they would be patient with regarding to not having enough wealth, for example, they are poor and so on and so forth. So the word Malik, the owner of all things, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that effect should be present in our hearts. Maliki Yawm al-Din. Yawm means the day. Yawm al-Din, the day of judgment. The day of judgment. And the word al-Din, it's the same word when we, use, when we use for religion. And the day of judgment, one of the names of the day of judgment is Yawm al-Din. The day of the Deen. The day of the reward or punishment. And this is the literal meaning of al-Din, that people will be rewarded or they will be punished, which is the characteristic of the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He is the owner of the Day of Judgment. He is the owner of this life and in the hereafter. But the Day of Judgment is mentioned here, as the ulama, they explained in the tafsir, especially the Day of Judgment, to show that this is where the hearts are attached to. This is when uh, in this life that we live in, people claim ownership. And the disbelievers, they do not believe in the ownership of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they don't submit themselves to it. But when it comes to the day of judgment, not even a person would claim any ownership because people then would realize the reality of all things and all ownership will be taken away from them. Even the deficient ownership won't be there. The same thing when it comes to the other meaning of Maliki Yawm din that he is the ruling judge in the day of judgment people might have some uh, ruling status on the face of earth. They can be kings, presidents, owners of things, and they have authority over people, over things. But in the Day of Judgment, there is no ownership. There is no status. There is no ruling over others. Everything is owned and ruled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that will judge among people. So that's why it's exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so it's a reminder for the human beings, for the believers, to have their hearts attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that there is no sound religion, no sound obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, unless the believers, they believe in the day of judgment. Otherwise, how would a person have patience, and have the 
uh, the, the ability and the zeal to struggle and to strive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we see so many injustices occurring in the face of earth, nobody can deny that. There's so much injustice, especially at a time when the religion of Islam, because of the weakness of the Muslims, is not prevailing. And as a result of that, you would see so much injustices on the face of earth. That people of wealth are being greedy when it comes to the poor and so on and so forth. And injustices and killing and so much uh, bad things and evil things that happens. That when a person ponder over this, he does not see the justice being prevailed at their lifetime. When a person is killed and he doesn't know why he's being killed or killed in an unjust way. Whereas the real justice will be served in the day of judgment. That brings the patience, the patience as a positive action, that the person is obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only in the day of judgment. And this is a very important point, that we as Muslims, we seek the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only in the day of judgment. In this life, yes, the person will be blessed as a result of being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the real reward that we, that we seek, our intentions when it comes to the good deeds, we seek the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only in the day of judgment. And that's why the verse, Maliki Yawmiddin. He is the owner, he is the ruling judge in the day of judgment. As we mentioned before, Surah Al-Fatiha has all the different meanings that are present throughout the Quran. If we look closely and deeply into this verse, for example, and discuss in more details of what is the day of judgment is, then we would go through so many verses in the Quran. The Quran has so many verses that talks about the Day of Judgment and how the believers would be and how the disbelievers and what has been prepared in the Day of Judgment for the believers and for the disbelievers. And actually the Day of Judgment before people would enter Jannah or entering the hellfire, the stages of the Day of Judgment, the many stages in the Day of Judgment, all of that is explained in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So this is a direction to us that when you recite Surah Al-Fatiha every time you stand in the Salah, that we have some form of a work that we need to do. We need to recite the verses of the Qur'an. We need to learn of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Qur'an and in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ about the things that would happen in the Day of Judgment. It's unseen to us, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it in the Qur'an and in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ for us to ponder over it, to act accordingly. That's why we seek the reward for our actions in the Day of Judgment. So this is definitely an effect that should be present in the heart when we recite Maliki Yawmiddin or Maliki Yawmiddin that the owner of all things, the ruling judge in the Day of Judgment is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are all attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from one verse to the other. So when we say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one to be worshipped with perfect love and perfect submission, He is the Rabb, He is the owner. He is the sustainer. He is the provider. He is the one that in his hands is life and death. And he is the owner of all that exists. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, we subject ourselves to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he created us to have mercy on us. So, uh, so that we would subject ourselves to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maliki Yawm din brings the fear in the heart of the believers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of the Day of Judgment. He is the ruling judge of the Day of Judgment. That means what? That means we need to act accordingly and to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day of judgment by being steadfast and obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life. So when we see Surah Al-Fatiha, this beautiful surah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, and there is some form of a dialogue as the Prophet sallallahu said that when a person is in the salah, there is a dialogue that he would speak and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say something. When we recite Surah Al-Fatiha, you say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say, Hamadani Abdi, my slave praised me. If you say, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say, Athna alayya Abdi, which means, my slave praised me, exalted me, but in a different way. Maliki Yawmiddin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say, Majadani Abdi, exalted me, my slave exalted me, when we say, Maliki Yawmiddin. And it goes on after that also with the rest of the verses of the Quran. And this is what we need to focus. That every time if we have this 
meanings in our hearts. This is what we get the response and that's why the effect of it should be very clear in our hearts, the effect of it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of the day of judgment. That means all of our actions, seeking the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day of judgment, saving ourselves from the punishment in the day of judgment, so that our life will be steadfast on the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be. We continue inshallah ta'ala with this verse and next verse after the break. Until then, we'll see you inshallah ta'ala. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and His mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim Each name has a meaning. Each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. Welcome back. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. We're still with verse number four, Malik Yawm al-Din. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. We talked about the verse number four, Malik Yawm al-Din, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of all things, and He's the owner of the day of judgment, and the effect of that in our hearts, that we seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, when regarding to the day of judgment, that He's the owner of all things, that we act accordingly, and we humble ourselves to the creator of the heavens and the earth, and we seek the help and the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we recite the Qur'an and we follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The next verse, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ This verse, verse number 5 in Surah Al-Fatiha, which means you are the only one that we worship and you are the only one that we seek help from. This verse is in the middle of Surah Al-Fatiha. Before it, you have praise. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with what we recite. After this verse, we make dua, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and so on. So this is in the middle as a covenant between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Surah Al-Fatiha teaches us how to humble ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to worship Him. It started with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Malik Yawm din It's all praise and all believing in the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an introduction that if these feelings are present in the heart, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most perfect, the one to be praised subhanahu wa ta'ala, the owner of all things, the Lord of whatever that exists, the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine all of these acts of worship are being filled in the heart of the believer, the one that recites Surah Al-Fatiha. That means now he is ready or she is ready to make this covenant truthfully with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You are the only one that we worship and you are the only one that we seek help from. The question is, when we say this, are we truthful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He is the only one that we worship? That He is the only one that we seek help from? If we apply the first three verses, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll be truthfully saying it so that we would get the great rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why as it's mentioned in the hadith, that I mentioned a part of it, the end of last segment, that the Prophet ﷺ said when the person in the salah would say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَيَاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say, هَذَا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي That this is between me and my slave. And actually the word abdi give you the feeling, the, the feeling of the love, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the believers and give them that feel of love and the mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them, for the believers when they recite Surah Al-Fatiha, when they are truthfully reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they say it truly, that He is the only one that they worship. The word na'bud, first of all it says, Iyaka na'bud, did not say, uh, we worship you alone, no, it, sar- it starts with Iyaka, and this has a significance to it in the Arabic language, which as the ulama they say, to feed al-hasr, meaning give you the benefit that he is the only one, exclusively the only one to be worshipped. Not like we worship Allah, that means 
you can worship other than Allah. Or we seek help from Allah, right? If a person says this, it can mean also that he seeks help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he seeks help from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in the verse, when the word iyaka comes first, it means he is the only one. Exclusively the only one that we worship is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only one that we seek help truthfully is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Na'bud is that we worship. It comes in the plural tense. The verb of al-ibadah. The ibadah is worship. And this is the purpose of our creation. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I created the jinn and the mankind for one purpose and that is for them to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So the word na'bud is the verb of worship. The definition of worship, what is the meaning of worship? Actually worship as an English word, it is not as comprehensive as the word ibadah in Arabic. The word worship might give you the feel that it's just some form of rituals that a person do. Movements or actions that a person would do once in a while, uh, a part of the day, part of the week, whatever there is. This is actually the, the sense that a person would get when he hears the word worship. That's why some people, they have some uh, difficulty understanding the verse that the only purpose of our creation is to worship Allah. Does that mean that we're supposed to be constantly standing in the salah? During the day and during the night, we don't eat and drink. Of course not. This is not the meaning of it. So how can the ayah, the verse of the Quran says that this is the only purpose, that our only job on the face of earth is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So that means, or ibadah in the religion of Islam, according to the understanding that we understand from the Quran, is far more comprehensive than the meaning of the word worship. And that's why it's, it's good to keep it as ibadah. It's good to keep it as iyyak and a'bud. Why is that? Because our salah, our prayers, before that our belief, our prayers, our charities, our fasting, our dhikr, when we make remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our relationships, eating and drinking, sleeping, even going to the bathroom, all of our affairs have to come under this purpose of our life and that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. How is that? It's very easy and simple. By just following what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us. So our beliefs is according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. We do the acts of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do in the most perfect way. We give the charity as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered. We fast, we make remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are kind to others, we are kind to the neighbors. All these types of relationships, we do it according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered when He said subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنَةً Speak to people with all that is good. This is by itself a very general term, a general order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're supposed to humble ourselves to it. Anything that is of goodness, we're supposed to speak to others with it. The same thing when it comes to eating and drinking. Everybody eats and drinks. But when it comes to the believers, because they know that they have been created only to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, they eat from the provisions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have a belief in it, that this food that you're eating has been written for you, that this is your provisions. From who? From the owner of the heavens and the earth, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the Muslim eats and he says, Bismillah before he eats, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is a blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't have the power to provide for our own selves. How many people they get together to fix the piece of bread that you would eat, for example, from the farm, all the way to the manufacturers of uh, flour, for example, and the, 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 the bag that you would have the, the, the bread in, and so on and so forth. All of these people, they get together by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide, and which the provision is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and the same thing for everything else. So the believers, when they eat and they, they drink, and when they say Bismillah in the name of Allah, and after they finish, they follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and they would praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying Alhamdulillah, alladhi at'amana wa saqana and so on, that they're praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means they are in constant worship and ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they would eat so that they will be able to stand in the salah and make ibadah. Otherwise, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, that we need to eat and drink. For what purpose? To be able to establish the salah to enjoin good and forbid evil, and to make the truth prevail, 
and to uh, forbid the falsehood and so on. All of that needs physical energy and we get that by eating and drinking. We have to get rid of the waste that we would have in our bodies. This is also done, something done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we follow the way of the Prophet alayhi salam, we would get the rewards. Why? Because we do this only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So basically al-ibadah is such a comprehensive word that encompasses everything in our life, whether it's speech or action, whether it's something that is done inwardly or outwardly. So everything is basically supposed to be acts of worship. And that's why the ulama, and again it might be a little bit dry when you hear these types of, of things, but it's important to comprehend it well and to refer back to these general terms because it makes it easy in our life. They, uh, when we recite the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, that we would find that the rulings are basically five. That everything that you do in your life has to be one of these five rulings. You are either doing something that is an obligation, and again we get to know this from the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, or you're doing the opposite of that, which is the haram, the forbidden things, or doing something that is recommended, that if a person, if he does, he would get rewards, if it's not done, a person won't get a sin, the recommended acts. And the opposite of the recommended acts is the disliked acts, the makruh. Although the makruh, if a person doesn't uh, do it, he would get a reward for not doing it. And if he does it, he won't get a sin. This is disliked. It's not haram. It's not into the level of a sin. And the fifth ruling is al-mubah, the permissible things. Eating, drinking, and so on and so forth. And all of this is part of our religion. We get to see how to do it and how to do it in the most perfect way according to the way of the Prophet ﷺ. So when it comes to the obligations, we do it in the most perfect way. When it comes to the haram, the forbidden act, we stay away from it. This is an act of worship, to stay away. Although you're not doing anything, but this is an act of worship. And when it comes to the recommended acts, we do it to the best of our capacity. And the disliked acts, we stay away from it to the best of our capacity. And when it comes to the mubah, to the permissible acts, we do of it according to the moderation of it. And according to the sunnah of the Prophet wasalam, you would find all of our affairs will be according to the purpose of our life. And that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So as a result of that, who is the one that we worship? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one that we make dua and supplication to is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one that we pray to is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and so forth. So he's the only one worthy of worship. So any order comes in the Quran later on, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, or you who believe, then what comes after it, that's order, an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something that we are forbidden to do, we submit ourselves. Why? Because we've been created only to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the worship. Actually the Prophet wasalam, again to show the virtuousness of Surah Al-Fatiha, he said in the hadith that we mentioned, that I mentioned with regarding to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to a person when he's reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قَسَّمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي نصفين. That the salah has been split between me, between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his slave and my slave into two. And the salah here refers to the Fatiha, to Surah Al-Fatiha. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Surah Al-Fatiha Salah, to show that the Fatiha is the prayer, how it is an important part of our prayer, and how it's a pillar of our prayer, and that's how we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with Surah Al-Fatiha, and with all the different orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the word, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ He's the only one that we worship, وَإِيَّاكَ نستعين, And you are the only one that we seek help from. Worship comes first because this is the purpose of our creation, and seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes right after that. We need power to do things. We need definitely the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the power that we have to even lift our hands is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He is the provider for this power. So as a result of that, we need the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to establish the first part of the verse, which is the ibadah. You know that the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are many in the Qur'an and in the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi wasalam, that we have to take many measures to fulfill the orders of Allah. And that's why the religion of Islam is such a dynamic way of life. 
that we cannot be lazy. We have to, when it's time for the salah, we have to take certain measures. We have to purify ourselves from impurities. We have to adorn ourselves with the wudu and perform the wudu. Physical actions that for us need to do. We have to, as men, to go to the masajid, to the houses of Allah, to make the salah. This is all needs some effort, needs some power for the person to do that. To stand and to make ruku' and to make sujood. For the hearts to be in state of humbleness. For the hearts to have the sincerity. To seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. All of that needs so much power and help and guidance from the creator of the heavens and the earth. That's why when we say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَيَاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ We say it in a humble way, in a very humble way, that this ibadah, this acts of worship, we can never do it unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this, that He is the only one that we seek help from in fulfilling the ibadah and fulfilling all of our affairs in our life. We need the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See how the perfect meaning of being servants and slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is served. When everything in our life, we seek the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fulfilling it. Even putting your shoes on, even lifting the food to your mouth, we need the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. With such beautiful dua, with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We seek the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone in matters of worship and all of our affairs. These two, if it's correct to say, variables in our life. The ibadah and al-isti'ana. Al-ibadah meaning the worship and al-isti'ana from nasta'in meaning the seeking help. When we seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These two acts of worship needs to be done in the most perfect way in our life. We would see inshallah ta'ala in the next segment how people when it comes to al-ibadah wal isti'ana that are different. Some people perfected and some people have deficiency in one or the other. And how can we perfect our ibadah and our isti'ana seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we fulfill what Surah Al-Fatiha is calling us to do to be steadfast on the deen of Allah. So inshallah in a few minutes we continue with the verse Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in. Who should you marry? When is it time for divorce? I want my children to love Islam, but I don't know how. The Qur'an and Sunnah has the answer to these questions and more. To find out what those answers are, check out Family Issues and see the difference clear guidance makes. Uh, with the verse number 5 in Surah Al-Fatiha How can these two acts of worship be perfect in our life? Of course we cannot be perfect in the meaning or the sense of being perfect because we have to fall in some deficiencies and that's why we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly with seeking forgiveness from the creator of the heavens and the earth and that's why the Prophet والسلام, used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness every day hundred times. And he said subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ That know that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. This is the tawheed, the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ And seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your sins. So this is the practicality of the deen of Islam. We are human beings. And this Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the human beings that they should not be in state of despair from the mercy of Allah. They need to constantly repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and always asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. So al-ibadah wal-isti'an. 
Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullahi mentioned that people with regarding to al-ibadah, the worship, and seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is al-isti'ana, are of four categories. Pay attention with me because we need to figure out which one are we in and how can we be among the best of the groups that are mentioned. And it's very easy to memorize these four groups and to know them. How is that? You have two variables, right? Al-ibadah wa al-isti'an. Some people, they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. But they don't seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Or they, they, they're not good in this act of worship. They worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they make their salah, they give the charity and so on, but they don't seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to even fulfill the ibadah. They don't make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help them. They don't see that they are in need of the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to fulfill the acts of worship in the most perfect way. This is deficiency, definitely. The second group are the group that would have it in an opposite way. They do not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they do not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the perfect way, in which in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to be, but they seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many people are in this category. You would find them in times of distress. They say, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us. They would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their affairs of this life, to eat and drink and to have wealth and so on and so forth. But they don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have deficiencies when it comes to their salah. When we talk about the believers, for example, the Muslims. This is another deficiency. Because we need to seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we need to worship Him alone subhanahu wa ta'ala. A third category are the category of the people, those who do not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they do not seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is definitely a state of arrogance that the person needs to stay away from. Because we need to humble ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by worshiping Him alone. And we need to seek help from the Creator of the heavens and the earth. So a category of people, the disbelievers and the like of them, they do not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they do not seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of the Muslims when they have the title as being Muslims, but you won't find them establishing the salah, the prayers. They don't seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the benefit of just having the title as a Muslim? A Muslim meaning that he or she submitted themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the meaning of it. In what sense that we submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In beliefs, in actions. So we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how we submit ourselves to the creator of the heavens and the earth. So this is definitely not a good group. The best of the four groups, as you probably know by now, are those who would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the way of the Prophet والسلام, not according to their own desires, but according to the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, And they seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, whether regarding to matters of their salah, and in general, in all of their affairs. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they used to seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with even the salt that they put on the food. Or if their shoes, for example, need some repair, they would seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that doesn't take more than a state in our heart to be in. And for our dua, constantly we need to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet ﷺ said, الدُّعَاءُ هُوَ الْعِبَادَةِ That the dua is the ibadah. The dua is the ibadah. Why? Because you're either making dua, that praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or you're making dua seeking help and seeking goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And both are, are dua. Both are dua and both are acts of worship. So when we say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينُ We need to perfect it. We need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the orders of Allah and the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And we need to seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Seeking help from Allah, that brings the subject of a tawakkul. Putting trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Putting the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning that our hearts is uh, firm on the belief that everything is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He is the all, all healer, the all seer, that He hears our dua, that we need to be obedient to him and we seek help from him alone. And we take the means, we take the physical means, but we are content that everything is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the affairs of the people are controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as a result of that, we would do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us. And usually the issue comes when there is uh, some form of uh, opposite or contradictions 
when it comes to this is the order of Allah, establish the salah on time. And you have a materialistic needs in this life. Whether it's your work, your job, or being lazy, or whatever there is. Who would you put forward when it comes to these times where it's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If we put forward the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to have and to put the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're doing that. Why? Because you might leave uh, some form of a great deal that you would break in matters of investments because the adhan is being called and you need to make salah. So you have to have the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the provider, that He's the one that provides for you. You just take the means. But He ordered you now to establish the salah and He's the one that ordered you to seek His provisions. So He will provide for you. And you already taken the means. You're not staying at home making dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for you and you don't take the means. No, of course you take the means, but the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes first. You don't deal in what is haram. You don't buy and sell in something that is evil and it's forbidden for us. Why? Because you are an obedient slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So putting the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of our affairs is a result and a practical benefit that we would learn from Iyaka Na'bud. Seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of our affairs. And we need to uh, practice that gradually. This is something that would change our whole entire life. Because we are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of our affairs. Also, we got to learn that al-ibadah levels. And we have to uh, try our best to go from one level to the other. To establish the deen of al-Islam in our life in the most perfect way. Prophet ﷺ mentioned the authentic hadith uh, that in had the deen mateen, that this religion is very strong. So go into it with gentleness. So go into the levels of ibadah, the levels of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with ease and gentleness so that you don't uh, quit in the middle because we need the patience and we need the steadfastness and we need the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He's the one that bestows His mercy unto the believers to be steadfast on the deen of Allah. You see, many of us, we would say we wish that we are steadfast on the deen of Islam. Many of those who commit sins, they would say we wish that we'll be steadfast on the deen of Allah. And this is something that is of their good nature. They want to be steadfast. They want to be religious and righteous and so on. But they have so much temptations or the environment that they live in is such a tough environment and so on and so forth. So they don't know how to do things and how to be steadfast on the deen of Allah. You need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely, truthfully. And if we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely and putting the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the sisters, she had a question and she sent that question to the program with regarding to her life and her job, for example, makes it difficult for her to wear hijab and things of that nature. This is the cure to our diseases. When we believe that the provider is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we need to seek help from Him alone. That if you quit this job that is preventing you from being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, never think or believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, abandon you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. He provides for a bird, for the, what is even smaller than that. He won't provide for the human beings, the one specially that would turn to the creator of the heavens and the earth alone. This is such an important belief that we have to have in our hearts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our provider. He's the one that provides for us. So put your trust in Allah. Put your trust in Allah by taking the permissible means. By depending on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered you to do and never be scared or afraid that you won't be provided for, that you uh, will be poor or whatever there is. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also it shows that guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need that. So that's why when we turn sincerely and truthfully, why do we keep repeating the issue of being truthful? We need to be truthfully making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He guide us to be steadfast on the deen of Islam. That we are strong facing the temptations and facing the tough environment that we might live in to be steadfast on the deen of Allah and to have the patience till our final destination, till we enter the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that we have to realize. Another benefit when it comes to reciting these verses of the Qur'an, that we need to take the time to learn the acts of worship, 
that since we say iyyaka na'bud so how can we worship Allah we have our hearts we have the tongue we have the different parts of our bodies each part has the five different rulings there is the permissible acts there is the obligations there is the sinful acts there is the recommended acts and there is the disliked acts this is with regards to the deeds of the heart with regards to what we say with our tongue with regards to what we do with our different parts of our body and all of that is laid clearly mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We cannot figure that in an hour or so. We need to take the time day after day, week after week to learn gradually. And every time we learn something, we apply it in our life. We do the best we can and we seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He can't do it alone. We need the help from Allah. We have enemies, you have the shaitan whispering. We have the physical enemies from the human beings and our own self that tends to be ignorant in many cases and many times as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran in عَرَضْنَا الْأَمَانَةَ عَلَى السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَالْجِبَالِ فَأَبَيْنَ أَنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا وَأَشْفَقْنَا مِنْهَا وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا جَهُولًا That the human being is ignorant and he is unjust. We need to lift from ourselves this characteristics of being ignorant by learning what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. We need to lift the negative characteristic of being unjust by doing righteous good deeds. So we have to put the effort. It doesn't come by default. We have to do something. We have to be patient in applying the orders of Allah. And we have to take that step and we seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we take the step. We turn to Him sincerely to guide us and to help us in whatever act of worship that you want to do. If you want to make the night prayer and you see that you are not able to get up at night and make your salah, and you feel that it's difficult for you, turn to the Creator of the heavens and the earth alone. Ask Him sincerely in your salah at any time that He would guide you and that He would help you to get up at night and for you to make the night prayer. So that you're not tired when you're making the prayer. Seek the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And then learning the etiquettes of doing that. And when you get up during the night, every step you take to make your wudu is not wasted. It's all rewarded for. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised the believers for such great rewards. By learning the virtues of these deeds, it would make the Muslims steadfast on these deeds and actions ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to learn how to be sincere and how to be truthful and so on. And all of these great qualities, we cannot do it on our own. We need the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We also learn that when we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of the day of judgment, that what gives us strength. When people always learn how to be confident in their actions, it's definitely a good thing. But we as Muslims, we say, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله, which means there's no might and power except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it even makes you stronger. And the strongest person on the face of earth is supposed to be the Muslim. When it comes to actions by the heart, the most brave, the most patient, the most truthful and so on, supposed to be the Muslim. And when it comes to actions done by our bodies, why? Because we seek help from the most powerful subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Al-Qayyim said in a very beautiful statement, the meaning of which, if we were ordered to push a mountain from its place, although we're not ordered to do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. All the orders are something that is easy for us. We're not ordered to do something that is over our capacity. If it's over our capacity, actually, you would find the ease comes in place. You're not able to make the salah standing, you make it sitting and so on. So he said, if you were ordered to push a mountain from its place, if this, if this was the order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and of course it's not, but if it was, if you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will do it. That means what? That means in all the orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just put your trust in Allah. Seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Be truthful about this. Take the means. You would find that the religion of Islam is so easy to be practiced. And you will have the joy in this life and in the hereafter as a result of being steadfast on the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to ponder over these verses. And we need to continue with Surah Al-Fatiha. And now we are at a point where after that it's the dua, the beautiful dua in Surah Al-Fatiha that we will talk about inshallah ta'ala if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us life next week. And please send your questions, your comments, your concerns, your suggestions even for us to make this program more benefiting and for us to act according to the Qur'an 
uh, so that we fulfill the purpose of our life and that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to adorn our hearts with the words of Allah, the Quran. And see you inshallah next week. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Afala yatadabbaroon al-Quran Walau kana min indi ghayri allahi lawajadu fihi ikhtilafan Afala yatadabbaroon al-Quran ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كبيرا فلا يتدبرون القرآن ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كثيرا